All right, let's uh, find a seat. We start our equipping hour here. All right, please find a seat and I will pray to open up our time. Please pray with me. Lord, we just uh, thank you that we get to gather together on another Lord's Day to worship uh, you, that we get to proclaim truth to each other. I pray that we would be worshipers today. We just thank you for just a sweet time of remembrance yesterday for Michael Kiwis, uh, your faithfulness, your grace in his life. Pray for just uh, Karis and the family that you would continue to sustain them. Uh, even today, Lord, we just thank you for your goodness that is just uh, on display, your grace that is on display in their lives. We pray all these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, we are going to be uh, doing a two-week series here in uh, First Thessalonians, looking at uh, Paul's ministry method in Thessalonica. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Kyle Frazee. I am a seminary student here at the Expositor Seminary. Uh, married to my wife Ashley over there with uh, four kids. And I'm going to bring to you uh, some of the fruit of some study we've done in our small group on First Thessalonians. And in First Thessalonians, the first three chapters, we get a window into Paul's method of ministry, how he does ministry, the things that he prioritizes, uh, the things that he says are important. We get a behind-the-scenes look at his character. Uh, we see how he does evangelism. We see how he does discipleship. So Paul highlights uh, the way that he came to Thessalonica. So that's the title of this series, The Way We Came. Paul uses that phrase in chapter 2 to highlight the, the method of his ministry, how he came to them. You see in uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, we have pastoral epistles that give us a blueprint for how to do church. They give us instructions for how we, how we should behave in the household of God. Well, in Thessalonians, we actually get Paul's uh, commentary on how he did church, how he set up this church in Thessalonica, specifically uh, his character, his evangelism. You see, the, the method of ministry matters. It matters to God. Obviously, there's clear instruction on method of ministry, how we do ministry, how we preach the gospel. God gives us clear instructions on evangelism. So we're going to look at some of that today. And we live in a world of, of pragmatism in the church. By pragmatism, I mean that we, that people would look to, uh, look to the, the results to justify the method. So judging ministry effectiveness by results, you might call that utilitarianism, to say that whatever works is what we do, whatever's the quickest way to get to a goal, that's what we do for ministry. So the method, isn't as important, but just the results. How do we get there? You know, the results might be good things. It might be converts, baptisms. It might just be something like church growth. See, in pragmatism, you have a vision, and then you do whatever you can to achieve that vision. And we see the fruit of that in churches today. We see unqualified pastors, uh, people that are, that are good orators, uh, compelling personalities. They can draw a crowd. Uh, they're fun to be around but they lack the character qualifications that, that the Bible spells out for, for people in ministry. Uh, we see that in just a, a youthy, immature church culture, trying to cater to the next generation. How do we appeal to the, the youth? How do we appeal to the next generation? People do this through silliness, through even crassness, through, through immorality, worldliness, to try to appeal to the next generation. We see uh, an obsession with church growth, just metrics, how do we grow a church? How do we get as big as we can, as fast as we can? And obviously we want church growth, right? We want to see people saved to come into the church, uh, to be radically transformed by the gospel. Uh, but when church growth becomes the, the end goal, how do we get more people here? You can see people running over God's clear instructions for how to do church, how to evangelize. So we're gonna talk about some of that today. I remember a, a conversation that I had with a, a pastor several years ago at a, at a large church, and he was talking about just the, that they saw a need for more men in their church. So the way that they approached this, that we need more men in the church, we're gonna go after the men in our neighborhood, 
so what they did is they, they did a, a demographic study of the surrounding neighborhood. What's the average income? What's the average age? You know, these guys have an average of three kids. They live in this type of house. They like, they like NFL football. They listen to talk radio. So then they found, okay, these are the ways we're gonna go after them. So let's do talk radio ads. Let's do some Facebook ads that, that they might be compelled so they could come to church. And then this pastor said that when they get to church, we want them to feel comfortable. So we want it to feel like a tailgate, right? These guys like football. So we want them to come. We're gonna have NFL on, on the screen. We're gonna have hot dogs on the grill. So it feels just comfortable for them when they come. And you hear that and you think, you know, that's obviously an, an extreme example uh, of someone that's trying to get to results. How do we grow a church with, uh, with seems like stepping over some of God's clear instructions for, for ministry, even a lack of trust maybe in God's word uh, to have authority and power. So we're gonna see here, Paul's method of ministry is just so radically different than that. Uh, Paul's evangelism, his discipleship is, is not pragmatic. It's not, how do I get to this goal as quick as I can? But it's, it's faithfulness displayed. Uh, it's a trust, a confidence in God's word that's displayed. So we're gonna see two aspects of Paul's ministry this week and next week. So this week we're gonna look at his evangelism. Uh, next week we're gonna look at uh, his character, the kind of man that he was. Uh, so this week would be the message, how he brought the gospel. Next week would be the messenger, the kind of person that he was as he brought the gospel. So we're gonna be primarily looking uh, at 1 Thessalonians chapter one, just, just zeroing in on verses four and five uh, as we look at Paul's method of evangelism, how he brought the gospel to this city. And we're going to see five non-negotiables for faithful evangelism. Five non-negotiables for faithful evangelism, uh, as modeled by Paul as he brings the gospel to Thessalonica. So just uh, by way of background, if you would turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. This is the, the start of this church in Thessalonica in the, in the first verse. So Paul has been in Philippi. He is beaten with rods in Philippi. He is chained, he's thrown in prison. His feet are put in stocks in Philippi. And you're, you remember the story, the, there's an earthquake. You remember the jailer, what must I do to be saved? Well, Paul is, is released from prison in Philippi and basically kicked out of town uh, the next day and immediately travels to Thessalonica. So let's pick up the story in Acts 17, verse one. Paul writes, sorry, Luke writes, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And they attacked the house of Jason, and they were seeking to bring them, bring them out to the people. If you go down to verse 8, they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities, and then verse 10, they say, it says that the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived there, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. So Paul comes into Thessalonica, preaches the gospel, gets run out of town, goes to Berea, gets run out of town in Berea. We find out three verses later that the Jews from Thessalonica actually chase Paul to Berea to kick him out of that town too. So we just see, see a little bit about the, the start of this church, gospel proclamation, there are some people that believe, uh, many that reject, and Paul's just uh, desire to, to preach the gospel wherever he goes in the midst of persecution, just as a first priority. And it's pretty amazing to think about him bloody, beaten in Philippi, travels straight to Thessalonica and does the same things, the same exact thing that would have got him beat up in Philippi. He goes and doesn't, doesn't waste a day, just shows up in Thessalonica and starts preaching the gospel in Thessalonica. Now with that background, we can uh, look at 1 Thessalonians. So if you would turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter one, and we'll be looking primarily at uh, verses four and five. 
Paul is now writing back to this church after he has news of how they're doing. So he left so quickly, he sent Timothy back to this church to check on them. Timothy brings a report back to Paul. So now Paul has this report, okay, they've been faithful, they've held on to this gospel message, they've endured persecution. So now Paul writes back to them to encourage them to continue to stand firm. So I'll just read uh, verses two through five just to give us, give us the, the context that he's writing and then we'll primarily be looking at verses four and five. He says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Verse three, Paul's gonna say one thing he is thankful for, constantly bearing in mind, he says in verse three, your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus in the presence of our God and Father. Now verse four, Paul's gonna give another reason that he gives thanks to God for them. He gives thanks, it says in verse four, knowing, brethren beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So we see Paul giving thanks to this church, thanks to God for this church. In verse four, he gives thanks, he says, because he knows God's choice of them. In the ESV, it says, we know brothers, that God has chosen you. This is God's sovereign election on display. Paul is saying, I know that God has sovereignly ordained you for salvation. He has actually put his stamp on you. He has saved you. I'm confident that you are saved, is what Paul is saying. And what's going on here, Paul is not, uh, he does not have a special revelation. He's not claiming, I've seen the Lamb's book of life, so I know your names are written in heaven. He actually is gonna give reasons why he is so confident in their salvation. He's gonna go through that in verses five through 10, Paul is gonna give reasons. Here's why I'm so confident in your salvation. You know, we might say something like, I'm so encouraged by God's grace in your life. I'm so encouraged by, by how I've seen the Lord work in your life. Well, Paul takes it up a notch, right? And he's saying, I'm so encouraged that God has sovereignly uh, elected you and his grace in your life has saved you. So he is just encouraging them. He's giving them confidence. And he's gonna give them this confidence by, by showing the, the way the gospel came to them, the fruit of the gospel in their lives, so that they would, they would endure, so that they would continue to be faithful. And just think about that in your own life, just the encouragement when people tell you, man, I've seen the gospel at work in your life. I've seen God's grace uh, give you maturity, help you battle sin, help you grow in holiness. That's holiness, right? That's such an encouragement to hear. So this is, this is what Paul is doing. He's encouraging them. And the way he's encouraging them is by reminding them of how the gospel came to them and the fruit of the gospel in their lives. So Paul here says, here is why I'm so confident that God has saved you. Verse five, the first thing he says is for our gospel came. So you might think, you know, if you were gonna say, what gives you confidence that someone's a believer? Maybe they're professed faith for six months. Okay, what, what would give me confidence to say, yes, I'm sure that they're in the Lord because of this or this. You know, we might think of something like, you know, 1 John, I think about, you know, fruit of a, of a life that's transformed. You have someone that hates sin, that loves God's people, uh, that loves the word, right? You might think of some of those fruits. But Paul is saying the first thing that he looks for is not the, not the fruit. He first, the first priority is, did, did they know the gospel? Did the gospel come? Right, that is the, the first priority. That's the first reason that he has confidence in their salvation. And then in verses six through 10, he's gonna show the fruit of the gospel. There's genuine repentance, uh, there's discipleship, there's love for God's word, love for God's people. But first, do they get the gospel right? Do they know the gospel? So that's gonna be our, our first uh, non-negotiable for faithful evangelism. We see what Paul did, his first priority, why he is so confident in their salvation uh, it's because of the gospel that came to him. So first non-negotiable is proclaim God's timeless message. Proclaim God's timeless message. And that might seem obvious. Obviously, our, our evangelism has to include the gospel message. Uh, but I think it's worth stating just to remind us that, that gospel ministry starts at proclaiming the gospel. Uh, there wasn't another first priority for Paul. It was gospel proclamation. That's where it started. That's where the eternity for these Thessalonians, it changed when Paul brought the gospel to them, right? Their eternity changed. 
They knew Jesus because Paul brought the gospel as, as first priority to them. And the gospel is God's message. This is God's timeless message. And it's a proclamation. The word means good news, and it's actually a proclamation of good news. This is declared truth, objective truth, a, a message of pardon for the sinner, of God's reconciliation to sinners. And I think oftentimes we might confuse the fruit of the gospel with the gospel, but the gospel is a, a spoken message. It's a declared message. It's a truth claim that God makes, that we make for God, appeal to men, that God has actually reconciled sinners to himself through this message, through the, the work of Jesus on the cross. So we see that the first priority for Paul is his confidence in their salvation is because they knew the gospel. And then there's fruit in their life. Right, he says, for our gospel came to you, not in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit. So what, what did Paul's gospel contain? All right, he says our gospel came. Well, what, what, what was the gospel that he preached? We get a, a little glimpse of this in Acts. We read in Acts 17. There's just one, one sentence in verse 3 where it says he preached that the, the Christ had to suffer, the Christ rose again, that Jesus is the Christ. So we see immediately that Paul is preaching Jesus. He's preaching Jesus as Messiah. He's preaching Jesus as God in the flesh. He's preaching uh, death, substitutionary atonement, resurrection. He's preaching the deity of Christ. He's preaching new life in Christ. So just think about for a minute what gospel message you would have to, to tell people to have confidence that they hadn't embraced something false, to have such confidence. I know that they've embraced the gospel, but what would you have to tell them to, to be so confident? What message to not wonder, ah, did they actually listen to the gospel or did they embrace something else? Well, I think you'd have to talk about God's holiness. You'd have to talk about sin, you know, God's standard for sinners that all have fallen short of God's glory. Think about Romans 3. You'd have to talk about Christ's atonement, like Paul does. You'd have to talk about repentance, turning away from sin, turning to Christ. Talk about Christ's righteousness in the place of sinners. God's wrath poured out on Jesus, his righteousness given to us, the great, great exchange of the gospel, that we get righteousness that we didn't earn, that we don't deserve, and that Jesus takes our judgment in his place, in our place. You'd have to, you'd have to preach that. Just think about the opposite. Think about kind of ministry that would be man-centered, that would invite someone to come to a show. You know, how would you be confident that they had embraced the gospel if you're giving them something that they want? Here's what I think is gonna be most compelling. You know, how would you be confident that they'd embrace the gospel and not just, oh yeah, it was fun. It was fun to watch football at church on Sunday. You know, you'd be confident if you had preached the gospel uh, as it's laid out in scripture, if, if that is what they believed. And then we see, you know, the change of life, like I said, in the next several verses, there was a, a, an obvious change of life, obvious repentance. You know, I think people uh, sometimes might say, you know, why don't you talk more about God's love? Let's lead with the love of God. You know, stop talking about sin, God's wrath, judgment. People would be more compelled by God's love than they would be by God's judgment. And I would just wonder, how do you talk about the cross if you're not gonna talk about sin, right? What did Jesus come to do? What did he die for? If we're not gonna preach, preach a message that, that people have sinned, that they have actually rebelled against God, well then the cross, there's, there's no reason to preach the cross, right? The cross is necessary because we are sinners, because we have rebelled against God. And that's an offensive message, right? It's offensive to tell someone that, that the, only, the only payment that would actually reconcile you to God is the, the spotless Lamb of God. That that is, the only, that is the only payment, that is the only thing acceptable to God. It's not your own righteousness, it's not your goodness, it's not your trying hard enough, that you actually deserve judgment. And Jesus, Jesus' blood is the only thing that would reconcile you to God. All right, that is offensive, that's an offensive message to those who are perishing, to those who, who wanna be self-righteous, see themselves as being pleasing to God on their own terms. But that's the message of the gospel. Think about even John 3, 16. You know, God so loved the world. In what way did God love the world? In this way, that he gave his own son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So there's God's love on display, and if you don't believe that message, you will perish. Right? Even in that verse, we see there's a, this implicit, implicit idea that if you don't believe the message, you are actually going to perish. That's the, the stakes are pretty high. We must preach not just God's love apart from sin, God's grace apart from sin, but both God's grace to sinners in the gospel and, their, and the sinner's sin, right? Their offense against the holy God. We see that in Paul's life. We see that in his preaching. We see that he did not preach a, an easy believism. Uh, verse 6 of this chapter, verse 6, he says, you also became imitators of us and the Lord. So there's a discipleship on display. So Paul's preaching led them to, to see their needs. Oh yeah, now I have to follow. Now I have to follow the Lord. We see in, in verse 9 of chapter 1, the second half of verse 9, it says, And you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So we see a turning. We see repentance, right? A turning away from sin, a turning to God. So Paul is preaching a message of repentance. He's preaching a message. You have to turn away from sin. You have to turn from idolatry. I often, I often have called it preaching the, the bad news. Right, there's actually bad news in the gospel, and that, maybe that sounds kind of funny, and maybe that's an unhelpful way to think about it, because the gospel means good news. Right? The word itself is good news. It's, it's good news of God saving sinners. But when you tell someone what the Bible says about sin, when you tell someone about God's standard, about God's holiness, for the, the one who doesn't yet believe, that is bad news. Right? That's, for them, it's bad news. Right? And the good news is that God has grace to even those that, that love themselves. But to offer someone hope of forgiveness before they actually recognize their own sin, that forgiveness is not theirs. They actually can't have that forgiveness until they see their sin rightly. So it's only good news to those who receive it in faith. So we must preach the, the indicting truths of the gospel. And if the Spirit is working, people will see their sin rightly. They will cry out for mercy. See, God's holiness is is hard news for the unbeliever because they are currently under God's wrath, under his judgment. To tell someone that God loves you, that he sent his son to die for you, well, how would you know that? If they never believe, how would you know that God loves them and sent his son for them? Right, the, they could want forgiveness. They could want eternal life just for self-preservation. Oh, well, sure, I'd love to go to heaven. <laughs> Who doesn't want to go to heaven, right? But, but do they actually see their sin rightly? Do they actually love Christ? Do they want to go to heaven because Jesus is there or because they just want relief? So that's why we must preach the, the hard message, the hard truths of the gospel, uh, just sticking to the guide rails of this book, right? Just telling people, here's what God says about sin. Here's what God says about his standard. Here's what God says about atonement and forgiveness of sins. And then ask, what does that say about you? This is what God says. Now, what does that mean for you? And we don't say this in an insulting way, right? I'm not saying we should use a megaphone and, and holler at people. You know, Paul, and we're going to talk about this next week, Paul displays gentleness in this message, grace, kindness. He is, uh, says he's like a, a nursing mother in the way that he treats these people. So there is no, there's no unkindness in this message. Uh, there's no gruffness. It's gentle, but it is a, a hard message. Just think about why Paul would get persecuted in every city. Our people aren't persecuting him because he says they need to experience love or because he says that he has an answer to their trauma and their brokenness. They're persecuting him because he's preaching Messiah crucified. The same reason that they killed Messiah, right? Because he said they must repent. They must follow him. They must turn away from everything they've thought of themselves and cast themselves on Jesus. That's why they're persecuting Paul because they love themselves. They don't want to stop worshiping themselves. So just think about just some implications for us as we think about Paul's bold gospel proclamation. Just consider, if, if you are you ready to step into conversations with the gospel? Do you have truths in mind, passages in mind, that you can quickly go to? You know, thinking about just different conversations you might have in the workplace. Am I ready to step into those with gospel truth? Have I thought through ways to articulate gospel truth? So that's our first point. 
is proclaim God's timeless message. First, non-negotiable for faithful evangelism. Again, it seems obvious, but uh, we must proclaim the one message that can save sinners. As Paul highlights, the, the way the gospel came gives him confidence in their salvation. So second non-negotiable for faithful evangelism is magnify the Spirit's regenerating power. Magnify the Spirit's regenerating power. Paul says in verse 5, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and then with full conviction. So this good news came a certain way, Paul says. He says it didn't come in word only. And what he's saying is, when he says it didn't come in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, he's saying this is not a human message. This is not just mere words, like every other message, every other proclamation. This is not like any other message. This is not a human message. This message came with the, the very power of the Holy Spirit. And he's not saying, don't use words. He's not saying that this is a message that absent of words, right? We can only use words. Like I said, the gospel is a proclamation. It's a declaration of what God has done. It, it must use words. It's the only thing we have is words to declare this message. But what he's saying is it's not just any words. This is not just a, a human message. This is a divine message. You see, Paul is not here trying to win an argument, trying to say, I'm going to compel you by my own reason, by my own logic. I'm going to win you to Christ by, by arguing truth with you. He's actually saying he presents the gospel to them, and this is God's power to save sinners. They're not following Paul because he is such a good speaker, because he's so compelling. They're following because they've seen their sin exposed, their need for a savior, and the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts to embrace this message. So when he says it came in power and in the Holy Spirit, what he's saying is that the Holy Spirit's power was on display in the gospel message preached. That this was a miraculous event, the Holy Spirit actually causing new life. This is regeneration. What he's not saying is that, that, that there was miracles. Paul came speaking and doing miracles, and that gave evidence. You know, there's cases where Paul does do miracles uh, to, to actually validate his ministry, but here he's not talking about miracles. He's talking about the Holy Spirit's power to give new life in the heart. He's talking about regeneration. See, that, that's the power that was on display. When these words were spoken, the Holy Spirit used them in the heart of the unbeliever to bring new life. That's the power on display. That's what's going on here. So these are the very words that the Spirit uses to bring the dead to life, the gospel. This is the Spirit's power, supernatural power on display. And just think uh, for a minute that, think about God's means for saving sinners for, for 2,000 years since this is written. You know, there's one way that God saves sinners, through gospel proclamation. Through these words, truths about Jesus, his death in the place of sinners, his resurrection, defeating death, new life in Christ. These are the only words that have saved sinners for the last 2,000 years. This is the only means that we have, and this is what the Spirit uses to bring new life, the gospel. Faithful preachers, neighbors, moms, dads, friends, missionaries have brought this gospel message. Think about your own life. You know, parents, pastors, friends, neighbors maybe, you know, that brought you this gospel message. This is God's means to save sinners. And this message put the Holy Spirit's power on display by bringing the dead to life. You have sinners who are running headlong into sin and death, and now they follow Christ. Again, in, in verse 9, Paul says, second half of verse 9, that they turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God. So you had a bunch of idol worshipers that are now on fire for Jesus, following, repenting. So on Friday, they're serving themselves, enslaved to sin, just a, a wicked, immoral city, cult prostitution, and then Saturday, Paul's in town preaching the gospel, and now they're followers of Christ. Just think about the, the power on display there, the Spirit's power on display to change idol worshipers, immoral, licentious people, to now followers of Christ. That's power, right? That's, that's regenerating supernatural power. And that's the issue here, is where does the power lie in our gospel proclamation? 
as we think about proclaiming the gospel, what power do we have confidence? Do we think of, of the, God's power or do we give man some kind of power? Do we think, well, people can reason themselves. There's some ability in man. There's something in man that could actually decide that this is a good message. Or do we actually put God's spirit on display that he must bring the, be the one to bring new life? Maybe you're wondering what would it look like to preach a gospel message that doesn't highlight God's power? What would that look like to preach a message that doesn't highlight God's power? Well, if you just turn real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, sorry, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Again, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Paul is going to show us what a, what a message would look like that comes uh, without the power of the Holy Spirit, that puts the power in the, in the hands of man. He says in chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Indeed, the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks search for wisdom. So you have Jews here that are saying, we want to, to see something miraculous. We want you to prove to us that Jesus is the Messiah through a miracle, through something that we can touch or see. We want a voice from heaven to tell us. And then you have the, the Greek seeking wisdom. They want a logical argument. They want, to, they want to see if this can be proven. They want the data. You know, today that might sound like, show me the science behind this. I want to see the data so that I can believe this. You know, we might be tempted to think, well, if I can just prove the Bible is accurate, is historical, if the archaeology, you know, would show evidence, Jesus was a real person, the Bible is real, well, then they would believe, right? That would be so compelling. But Paul says he's not going to do that, right? He's not going to appeal to their emotions. He's not going to appeal to their reason, He's not going to put them in the driver's seat to say, here's what we think is most compelling. Just think about Lazarus for a minute, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus raises a dead man out of a tomb, and then immediately people want to kill Lazarus. They want to kill Jesus. People that saw Lazarus who was dead, now alive, actually want to kill Lazarus because they hate Christ. So it's not a, it's not a problem of, of seeing the evidence. They saw the evidence, right? It was a heart issue that the spirit would have to, to overcome, right? The supernatural power would have to be on display there. It's not an evidence issue. When we do this, when we appeal to the, the sinner's sense of what, hey, well, here's what I think is gonna be most compelling to me to believe the gospel, we're actually letting man be in the driver's seat. We're letting them say, I'm gonna weigh the evidence. I'm gonna tell you what I think is most compelling. Either it's a miracle, either it's some kind of argument, it's some kind of data that I need to see. And, and then the, the unbeliever actually is sitting in the driver's seat saying, I'm going to weigh all of, the, all of the evidence. I'm going to decide which one fits my test of believability. And then I'm going I'm to decide what I want to believe. And that's not the gospel, right? That's not the power of, of God on display. Right? The Holy Spirit actually has to bring new life. Look, look what Paul says in verse 23. When he says the Jews ask for signs, the Greeks seek wisdom, he says, but we preach Christ crucified. So he's not going to give it to them. He's not going to let them dictate what they think is the most compelling. And here's why. Look what he says. To Jews, this is a stumbling block. To Gentiles, foolishness. But, verse 24, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So he's saying that the, the ones who want this evidence, he's not going to give it to them. He's just going to preach Christ and where God is working where God's power, his Holy Spirit is on display, sinners are gonna repent and believe. They're gonna believe that message when God's, when God's spirit is working. So that's, that's the key here, is putting God's power on display. When sinners embrace the gospel, God's power is on display. And gospel preaching is preaching to the dead, right? It's an impossible task. There's no compelling, no human words, no arguments that could make dead people alive. The Holy Spirit has to do that, right? We scatter the seed, we proclaim truth, you know, maybe, maybe in, in a moment over years, planting seeds, think about with our kids, you know, you're just hammering things into their conscience over years that maybe five years later the Lord uses to save them. But we just scatter the seed and the Lord has to do the work in their heart. So as you think through this, just consider, 
do you share the gospel like there is supernatural power to save sinners? Do we believe this as we think about gospel proclamation, that the Spirit actually uses this message to bring people to life? That we just get to preach a message and God actually uses that supernaturally to bring the dead to life? So how might it manifest if we're not magnifying the Spirit's power? Some indications that I just, as I was considering, what are some ways that we might do this? We might exalt another power besides the Spirit's power, more of a man-centered message I think we can do this just even in, in simple ways of thinking that, you know, the, the preacher has more authority. There's more power in his proclamation. So if I can just get someone to hear my pastor preach the gospel, then they'll believe, right? Because he's just, man, he's so clear and he's so passionate. Um, and it's great, you know, bring people to church. They will hear the gospel. You know, I affirm that, do that, keep doing that. But to think that somehow that, oh, that guy, if they just heard that guy preach, then they would believe. And it's not, the, it's not the preacher, it's the, it's the message, right? It's the proclamation of truth that they must hear. And God has to use that. He can use that through a pre preacher. He can use that through a uh, conversation with your child. He can use that, you know, with a grocery store cashier. Uh, just the gospel message proclaimed. God uses that to save sinners. You know, there's uh, signs on the South 202 that I've seen for, like, different men's conferences. And I don't know, I don't know much about the conferences, but I just see the, the signs are always... Uh, a football player, kind of ex-celebrity. It's like, you know, come hear this guy. And it's, and I think they're a Christian conference, you know, come hear this guy. And I think there's just a, we have this thought that, oh man, if this, if they heard this athlete, this celebrity preach the gospel, if they heard that that guy was a believer, that would be so compelling to them. And, and the reality is that there's nothing more compelling, like I said, about, about the messenger. It's the message that they have to believe. God has to use that message to save the sinner. You might even think that relationships, there's some inherent power in relationships. You know, I, I think I, I'm tempted this way to think, well, if I knew this person a little better, maybe if we talked about football for a little bit, we went to a game first, and then I'd have a, a better avenue. Uh, maybe that'd soften the blow a little bit, you know? And then, and then they might embrace the gospel and just, uh, and just really having more confidence in a, in a closeness of a relationship that somehow that would soften the blow, that that would help them to believe um, and that's just, there's not power, inherent power in relationships. Obviously, relationships are a great platform, you know, to be able to, to meet your neighbors. I'm just talking to a friend that, you know, is having, having breakfast with some unbelieving neighbors and just looking for opportunities to serve them and preach the gospel. Like, that is really a sweet way to, to use your platform as a neighbor to, to bring the gospel. But there's not inherent power in, in relationships and friendships to, to soften people's hearts. I think another way that we may um, minimize the Spirit's power is just being unwilling to say hard things, maybe being afraid of someone's response. Oh man, they're so hard-hearted. There's no way they would believe this, right? I'm sure we can all think of someone in our lives that, that seems so far gone. You know, I'm sure we all have the person that's like, oh, they're so hardened to the gospel. There's no way that they would believe. You know, do we have confidence that that person, even the, the, the most hardened person in our life, if they heard the gospel, God could use that. God would use that. That's the means that he uses to save. Another way I think we can minimize the Holy Spirit's power is just growing weary in gospel proclamation. I think of just parents with our kids. You know, I've told them this a thousand times. They haven't listened. Do I need to keep telling them the same message? You know, maybe, maybe they need to hear it a thousand and one times. Maybe it's, you know, five years later, like I was saying, that they've just, it's been hammered into their conscience. So it's to not grow weary, right? This is God's power to, to bring the dead to life. When we use a, a man-centered message, method, we aren't highlighting God's power. We're highlighting man's power, man's ability to reason. Here's what, what man decides he thinks is most compelling. But the reality is God decides what's most compelling. It's his gospel that the Holy Spirit uses in the heart to change, to change life. So we see God's power on display here. Paul preaching this message, getting beat up in Thessalonica, and people being saved. And when people embrace Christ, when they agree with God about their sin, that is, that is the Holy Spirit's power on display to change a heart. So that's our second point, magnify the Holy Spirit's regenerating power as we think about gospel proclamation evangelism.
Now, thirdly, our third non-negotiable for faithful evangelism, be driven by faith-filled conviction. Be driven by faith-filled conviction. Paul says that his gospel came in power and in the Holy Spirit, and then it came with full conviction. Now, this is conviction from Paul. So he's putting God in the driver's seat, and he has conviction that God will bear fruit. And he suffers for it. All right, Paul comes to town and suffers. He's not just giving people some options, not just saying, hey, this is my truth, you have your truth, we'll just decide which one, or you just, you, you do you, I'll do me. You know, he's not saying, here, watch this video series, or here's an essay I wrote. He's actually proclaiming truth to them, and they persecute him for it. So he obviously has conviction. It tells you what he, what he values, right, what he believes. If you're willing to suffer for this message, to have that kind of conviction, then you believe this message has power. You know, there's, there's plenty of people that might affirm the doctrines of grace, you know, sweet truths that we would affirm about God's sovereignty and salvation, about the depravity of man, about God's supernatural power to sustain us. But then you, but then you look at ministry methods and you wonder, are you, are you actually, do you have conviction about those truths? Because when you appeal to, to man on his terms and you do the, you know, the barbecue and the NFL game on Sunday, trying to draw people in on their terms, it, it seems like there's something missing between the holding to a doctrine of, of God's salvation, of God's sovereignty, of man's depravity, when we're catering to, to man's felt needs in that way, to think that people, they need to have fun first. They need to see something compelling first. Maybe we can remove some of the obstacle. You know, that's not conviction. That's not trusting God's method. I'm convinced if we had more conviction, more confidence in God's message, we would preach the gospel more. If we believed this is the only, the only method, the only way that God saves sinners is through the gospel, we would preach it more if we had that kind of conviction. Just think about times when you've been afraid to speak the gospel, slow to speak. Maybe there's a fear of man. Just in those moments, did you have conviction? Were you living with a, a faith-filled conviction that this message is what they need? Even just consider your prayers. How much do you pray for people to be saved? How much do you pray when you have an opportunity to, to preach truth to someone? Do you pray about those things? Are you on your knees, dependent on God's spirit to work? You know, our conviction is gonna be, gonna be known by our prayers. And maybe you're thinking, how do I build conviction? I want to have conviction like Paul. I want to preach the gospel like Paul preaches the gospel. Well, just some, some practical thoughts. I think that just informing your heart with God's truth, just knowing what the, the Bible says about, about hell, about eternity, uh, about suffering apart from Christ, you know, fill your heart with those things. Think about those things. Those are hard truths to dwell on but they actually help us build the kind of conviction that would say, yeah, that people need to hear this message. Jonathan Edwards has a quote. He says that just this desire to have eternity stamped on his eyeballs. And he says, let eternity be stamped on my eyeballs. Just to think about eternity every day. To look in our Bible and see those, those hard realities of judgment. Consider the grace that you have received. Consider God's grace in the gospel to you. That'll help you build, build conviction. Think about the forgiveness, the reconciliation that you have in Christ. See, our, our ministry method is an indicator of our faith. Do we trust God's power? Do we trust that he brings the dead to life, that he uses this message to save sinners? It is a matter of conviction. So that's our third non-negotiable, be driven by conviction. Fourth, non-negotiable for faithful evangelism that we see from Paul. Uh, we see him model godly character. Model godly character. He says near the end of verse 5, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So he says what kind of men we prove to be among you. We're going to pick this up in detail in next week looking at chapter 2. But, but Paul says that his, his manner of life is important. He actually proved himself to be faithful. That there was not uh, some inherent power in Paul's life, like I said, the power is in the gospel, but 
but his character was not a hindrance to the message. Right? He did not come uh, with a, a gruffness, uh, unkindness. Right? He was gentle. He was faithful. He labored night and day for these people. So his lifestyle was a platform for ministry. You can be a, a hypocrite. Right? If you're a hypocrite, you could close the door to gospel ministry. If someone sees your life, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't want any of that. To say, like, Jesus transforms the heart. Jesus actually brings the dead to life. And then to live like the world. To say he actually gives us new desires and we're not slaves to sin anymore. And then you live like, like you're a slave to sin. Right? That's, not, that's not a compelling gospel message. That's actually going to be a stumbling block. And we want the stumbling block to be the gospel, to be Christ, not to be our own hypocrisy. So Paul's model of godly character actually was a platform for him to preach the gospel. He actually proved himself to be faithful. So he had a platform to preach the gospel. I just think about when I read this, I think about uh, just our missionaries in PNG, uh, the Cans, who uh, I think Zach, Zach is preaching today. So that'll be, uh, be a treat. But just think about the Cans and their character uh, in, in, uh, in Papua New Guinea just for years. Right, they left everything, left family, friends. They labored to build a house, to learn a trade language, to learn a tribal language, to translate, to teach people how to read, to, to preach and teach. And this has been over years that they've labored, that they've proven their character. So for someone to, to, to accuse Zach of, of some ulterior motive, oh, he's not in it for us. He's in it for something else. You know, it would just be foolishness, right? You've seen his proven character. He's displayed proven character. And now that gives him a platform. That gives him credibility, right, to have conversations with people. Again, the power is in the gospel, but to actually have a, to be able to have that conversation. He's proved himself. They've proven themselves to be faithful. So that's our fourth non-negotiable model godly character. Just faithfulness displayed. Relationships that are a platform through our character. Last, non-negotiable for faithful evangelism, be compelled by love. Be compelled by love. Paul ends this verse by saying that they came, he says, for your sake. For your sake, he says. So they did all of this for the sake of those, not themselves. They weren't self-focused. Uh, they were doing Going, willing to do whatever it costs, whatever inconvenience, uh, laboring, late nights, hard conversations. Uh, he didn't even know the immediate fruit. Right? He's kicked out of town. He has to find out later from Timothy whether or not they actually stayed faithful. So Paul does this without even knowing if they're going to be faithful. He just labors day and night for their sake, he says. This is why we do it. This is why we have hard conversations out of love for others. Right? Your best friend is the one who tells you the most truth. Paul is committed to their good, so he tells them hard truths. He tells them what they need to hear because he loves them. You think about just times when you, you don't say hard things to people. Oh, I'm afraid of what they're going to think of me. I'm afraid of how I might offend them. Right? And just a, a self-focus. Right? That's, that's self-love, right? Love of others would cause us to go, oh, this is what they need to hear. I need to say this because I love them, and this is what they need to hear. That's, that's real love. That's not self-love. So Paul here is not trying to gain approval, not trying to gain a following, but because he loves sinners. He wants them to be saved. This is what they need to hear. So be compelled by love. That's our last non-negotiable faithful evangelism. We looked at God proclaiming God's timeless message magnifying the Spirit's regenerating power, being driven by our conviction, modeling godly character, and being compelled by love. So maybe you're thinking, why does this matter? Why is this so important? Well, I think, think about uh, just vertically, God's glory is at stake. You know, God's glory is at stake in the way that we do ministry. Who do we hold high when we're preaching the gospel? Like I said, do we hold the spirit high, God's power, or do we hold man's, man's ability, man's reasoning high? God's glory is at stake. God is glorified when sinners embrace the gospel. Think about for the unbeliever. If we aren't committed to a, a faithful method of evangelism, 
if we aren't telling a, a sinner that they must come to the end of themselves, but just offering them some kind of self-help, you know, get out of hell, you don't have to go to hell, you can have fire insurance, and there's no repentance, well, we're actually affirming them, right, in their unbelief. You actually could affirm someone's self-righteousness, pat them on the back, okay, good, I can go about my merry way without actually ever coming to, to see that they actually need to be saved. All right, that's not love, that's not helping the sinner. Uh, the last reason this matters is just for our own confidence, just to trust God's method, uh, to have conviction, to know that, that God saves sinners this way, just to, to reinforce our confidence, that there's not, not anything complicated about this. The goal here is not to, to put a checklist in front of you, to say you must do these, make sure you check off these boxes before you talk about Jesus, but to say you actually can have confidence with a, a simple message, a biblical message, and then let God's spirit work. Like I said, we just plant the seeds and then we, we see what God does. So you can have confidence to, to preach this message, to proclaim this truth. And the goal here is also not, not to disparage others, not to discourage, not to criticize, but just to equip us to think rightly of how do we bring truth to others? How do we bring the gospel, the substitutionary atonement of Christ to sinners, the only way that they can be saved, that the only way that they can be reconciled to God, to have a, a righteousness that's not theirs, that's, that's, what, that's what this world needs. They need a righteousness that they don't possess. They must believe in Christ for that righteousness. And we could have a, a really tight method like this. We could have a really tight, tight method and say, okay, great, got it, got all these things, and then we could still be cold, be indifferent, not preach the gospel, right? And there'd be a disconnect there. If we affirm these truths, then we have to proclaim these truths. We have to tell people these things. It'd be like, uh, one analogy I heard recently is be like, you know, reading a book about riding a bicycle without ever riding a bicycle. You know, to say, hey, we're gonna read about these things, we're gonna learn about these things, we're never gonna do them. But to actually be faithful, to, to bring the gospel to bear. Let me just close with a quote um, from uh, Horatius Bonner, who was a Scottish pastor in the 19th century. A uh, book's called Words to Winners of Souls, just a little encouraging, almost devotional book that is just an encouragement toward evangelism. I think we have some, uh, Dustin said, back in the, at the book table. Words to Winners of Souls, it's called. And he says, He that saved our souls has taught us to weep over the unsaved. Lord, let that mind be in us that was in thee. Give us tears to weep. For, Lord, our hearts are hard toward our fellows. We can see thousands perish around us, and our sleep never be disturbed. No visions of their awful doom scaring us. No cry from their lost souls ever turning our peace into bitterness. Our families, our schools, our congregations, not to speak of our cities at large, our land, our world, might well send us daily to our knees. For the loss of even one soul is terrible beyond conception. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered the heart of man what a soul in hell must suffer forever. Lord, give us the bowels of mercy. What a mystery, the soul and eternity of one man depends upon the voice of another. We see God's, God's means for saving sinners, uh, just the gospel proclaimed through us frail, broken, people that gets to proclaim God's timeless message. Would you close, close in prayer with me? God, we uh, thank you again for your word that is powerful. We thank you that the gospel came to us, that we heard your truth, that we heard a message of forgiveness, of reconciliation, that we saw our sin rightly, we saw your holiness rightly. Lord, we just thank you for saving us. We thank you that we get to, to share this, this message, your message. We thank you that we get to, to speak these eternal truths, Lord, that we don't deserve to speak. We didn't earn, Lord, but you are just so gracious and kind to us. So I pray that we'd be faithful evangelists. I pray that we would love others well by giving them truth. And I pray that we would just trust wholly in you, Lord, for the results. For all these things, Jesus, in your name, amen. All right.
Thank you for being here. You're dismissed until 10.15.